Our scripture reading this weekend comes from 1 John, chapter 1, starting with verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Three and two and one, one. Good morning. How are y'all? Good to see you. Um, so we are in a series uh, on the book of First John, um, which is a, a short letter in our New Testament that I personally enjoy. And maybe I would recommend that over the next few weeks, um, uh, maybe a good practice would be to read the letter um, just once a week. And uh, it's, it's not super long. And the reason why I would recommend that to you is John's writing style uh, is that he writes less like a historian or a scientist and more like a poet and a storyteller. And that means that his language is layered and he's weaving concepts together in and out. And it's one of those things, the first time you read it, it's fine. And then the second time you read it, it's a little better. And then the third time you read it, it's even better than that. And it kind of um, goes a little deeper each time you kind of take a look at it. So I would just recommend um, over the next few weeks, read the letter of 1 John uh, once a week. And maybe you can use a different version on your phone. You can find all the versions that are out there, um, translations. And uh, maybe that would be helpful. So Jeffrey did a great job opening us up last week, talking about um, that John's uh, fascination with um, this thing called the incarnation, that God became a person, a specific person in Jesus and how that changed everything. And I, I want um, this week to uh, talk about something specific that John kind of builds a sequence around. Um, but before we go there, what I'd like you to do is take a few seconds and think about this. If you're spending time with a younger person, either your own kid or a person you're mentoring uh, at work or the new kid on the block or a grandchild or whatever, someone who's young and you want them to have a couple of specific skills for life, like if these are things you know how to do, you're going to go far. These are big deal, kind of you can apply them in lots of arenas sort of things. Uh, what would a couple of those things be? If you can, do the, if you can learn how to do this. This is going to change your life. So just take a couple seconds and think about what those might be. A couple of those might be. Ready? Go. Okay, now if you would, turn to the person next to you and share what one of the two of those might be that come to your mind. And go. Okay, what are some of the things you're hearing? What's coming to mind? Respect. respect, learning how to respect others. Yeah, what else? How to be kind. Yes, that really matters. Last service, someone said basketball. I'm not sure what that was about. Uh, what, what else? Patience. How to, how to not lose your mind when things aren't moving at the speed you wish they were. Yes, that's a great skill to have. What, what, what else? Oh, what, 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 what was it? Communication, yes, learning how to communicate with each other, that's a big deal. A couple others? Perseverance, yeah, how to not quit just because things are tough. What else? Sacrificial love, how to, how to lay yourself down, how to lay your lives down uh, for those around you. Uh, let, me, let me give you one of mine, um, and this has always been one of, that's kind of on my heart, and I'm drawn to the subject of, and that's I want my kids and the people that I mentor and the people, younger people that I spend time around, I want them to know how to have joy. 
I want them to know how to have joy. First of all, isn't that something we all want? And second of all, isn't there a lot of stuff that we can do without if we know how to have joy? My guess is at some point you've been around somebody that has a lot of things going on in their life that you would find unacceptable to in your life, but they still have joy, and it makes you wonder why you freak out about all of this stuff over here. You, you know what I'm talking about? Maybe you've traveled and you've been around people that live in a dirt floor hut, and they have joy, and you can't figure out why you make car payments if you don't need to have a car to have joy. You tracking? And I, I imagine that as, as Christians, I would hope that there would be something special that we would have to offer um, each other around the subject of joy. But here's the problem. I, I know a lot of people that claim the name of Jesus that have about as much joy as a rock. And I know some people, this is even harder for me, that are very far from claiming the name of Jesus and they have quite a bit of joy. And so what is it there though that we have something specific to say and lean into maybe where we could learn about how do we find it, have it. And in the words of John, where we're gonna go is that he talks about having joy that's complete, having joy that's perfect, having joy that's lacking nothing, like total joy. How do, we, how do we get that? And so I just want to dive into the first four verses of this letter together. He opens up, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The, the, the word of life is one of his, how he talks about Jesus, that Jesus has come into the world, that he was this um, kind of almost like a, a concept, God out there that became God in flesh that we can see and hear and touch. He says, the life appeared. And this is his first little step on the way to complete joy. It starts with something that God has done. His progression to joy doesn't start with himself. It doesn't start with the circumstances in his life, what he's been able to create, what he's been able to make happen. It starts with something that God has done. It's actually rooted in who God is and not just in something that he's done. And when John, John says that God has done something, it's something very specific that he has in mind. And see, if you, if you read his writings, whether it's the Gospel of John or this letter, 1 John, um, kind of what Jeffrey talks about, talked about last week. You should go online and listen to it if you weren't here. He, he zeroes in on, on this, this relationship between the Father and the Son that existed from before time. But the Father and the Son and the love that moves between them is the Spirit. And that that is where all of creation was born out of. This relationship and joy that was shared between the Father and the Son from before time even started. And then that relationship between the two of them spills out onto creation out of joy and love and everything else comes from there. But when we, as a, as a human race, became a traitor race and turned away from God, that son left heaven to pursue us. He put on skin, became a person, went through life showing us what God is like. Then he dies for us and rises again on the third day, conquering sin and hell and death forever and sends a spirit to live in our hearts. That's the thing that John says, I saw it. I, I said, God did something and it changed everything. It starts with knowing that God did something specific and that that thing changes everything and makes the way for joy possible. As, uh, as he goes on, it's not just that God did something, this thing between the father and the son that reaches out to the rest of us. He says, the life appeared and we, we have seen it. It's not just that God did something, it's that we encountered it. It's that it mattered to me. It, it, it impacted my Life. I don't know if, if you know this, 
Um, but this thing about a relationship with God isn't just something we know. It's something that changes us, something that impacts us. And John says, I saw it. I, I heard it. I, I got my hands around it. And that it is a, is a person, Jesus. I, I cried with him. I got mad at him. We joked. We, we lived together for three years. We, he changed my life. You know, and I know that there's a lot of people that know about God, and maybe you're here today, but have you experienced, have you encountered the holy love of God in a way that's changed your life? I have, have you? Uh, it, it worries me that maybe there's a lot of people that know a lot about Jesus, but they haven't encountered the holy love of God. In my family, um, I, I wasn't born in a church building, but I was probably born in the parking lot. You know what I'm talking about? Like my family, we were like, we could walk to church. We were church people. And every day of my life, I would have um, said the right doctrine around Jesus. In kindergarten, I got in an argument with Andy Grable about if Jesus was the son of God or not. And my poor kindergarten teacher had to break up the fight. <laughs> because that's going to convince people about the love of Jesus. Yes, he is. And, um, but... There was a day in seventh grade where I remember hearing someone talk about that God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, and that he sets the lonely in families. And something happened in my heart that changed me. And I leaned in and said, God, if that's who you are, I want in. And since then, it's not that that's a one-time event, but I continue to encounter the love of God in, in a way that doesn't make it smaller, it actually makes it larger, and I just can't get over it. Last night, um, we were putting the kids to bed, and I was reading them a little uh, story uh, about Jesus out of the, um, our children's Bible, and I, I was reading about Jesus waking this girl up who was, who was dead, and I got, I got choked up. And, and couldn't keep reading. And my wife, who's folding clothes down the hall, she goes, is dad crying reading about Jesus again? <laughs> Kids are like, yes. I'm, like, I'm sorry, hang on a minute. I just can't get over Jesus. And his love and his kindness, Fred, Frederick Buechner says, the Christian is the one who points at Jesus and says, I can't prove a thing. But there's something about his hands, his eyes, the way he talks, the way he carries his cross, and the way he carries me. And I just can't get over him. And I know you may be able to say the right things about God, but have you encountered his love? He, he, he moves past just this encountering the love of the Father and the Son. He says, we have seen it, we encountered it, and testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. I, I want to zero in on a couple of um, verbs here uh, that we, uh, the life has appeared and we seen it and testify to it. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. So these two verbs, um, testify and proclaim, have a little bit of a different angle. Testify, um, in the Greek language this was written in, has the feeling of an eyewitness account. This is, I have experienced something, and because I have experienced something, I just am compelled compelled to say something about it because I experienced it, therefore I have to speak about it. And eyewitness accounts have a way of changing us and spreading in a new way and kind of um, pulling people in. That This wasn't something I could keep to myself. This is something I had to share with you. And it ends up kind of pulling people into the thing. Like how many husbands in here are afraid of their wives serving in the nursery because they might catch baby fever. And the wife is going to walk out of the nursery and say, we need to get one of these. And some mom is going to be like, can I have my baby back, please? And the dad's going to say, that thing costs thousands of dollars, right? Because when we experience something, there's something about it that we just have to share with other people when it kind of touches something deep in us. And he says, we have to te I testified about it because when I met Jesus, he changed my life and I can't, I can't keep that to myself. Then he also says, I proclaim it. And in, in the original language, kind of the connotation there is that, that that's when you are sent on a mission on, with authority 
on behalf of someone to share a message, like a king sending someone to the other side of the country to do his business in the name of the king. They are there to proclaim the will and the message of the king where they go. And so John says, it's not just that I've experienced it, I have to share with you because it's changed my life. I've also have to share because I've been sent with authority to share about this thing that has changed my life. Um, in, in our New Testament, uh, there's a word when, it come, when spiritual gifts are talked about. Um, they, they use the word apostle. And I'm not, um, uh, I don't dislike the word, but I think it misses something because we tend to think about just like the 12 apostles. Um, th that's a Latin word. The Greek word that it's translated from, I don't know why they translate a Greek word into Latin and then we still use the Latin. The Greek word is missio. It means to be sent on a mission. Today we use the word missionary. The, the, uh, the 12 apostles were the 12 missionaries of Jesus. That's why they're called apostles. That's what it means. They were the missionaries. And we are commissioned as missionaries into every sphere of life that we have to share about the holy love of God that has changed our lives. And I realize that that's not like um, super cool to do in America today. First of all, we're highly individualistic and we feel strange telling other people about something um, that may feel uncomfortable to them. The other thing um, is, is that you know Christianity isn't as popular as it used to be and it's okay if you're a Christian, but if you share that at the office, you instantly got sidelined from the good conversations around the water cooler. You know what I'm talking about? And so we just don't step out like that. However, John says, I've experienced something that I have to share. And I've been sent with authority to tell you about the holy love of God. And that, in of itself, changes things. Because, see, we have to move from the moral to the mystical is one of my favorite authors, Henry Nouwen, says, we, we have to stop thinking that what we tell people about is about morals and ideas and philosophies and rules. That's actually not really worth sharing. And no one cares what you have to say about that, and they don't care what I have to say about that, and that's probably fine. What we have is not a moral system we have something mysterious, something mystical, something relational to invite people into. Something that I can't even really wrap my head around. Christianity didn't start because people wanted to write a new philosophy of religion. No one said, I've got an idea. Let's write a new thing about how we can get close to God. And I've got some ideas and some rules and some laws and, and some principles. And we're just going to put that on paper and we'll call it Christianity. That's not how it started. Christianity started because there was an event that rocked human history so deeply that it defined everything before it and after it, and that thing is the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the outflow of that is Christianity. There was this thing that people couldn't get over, and they said, it changed everything about me, and I'm trying to figure out what to do with that thing that happened, and that is Christianity. And what you get to offer people isn't just advice about their morals. You get to invite them into the holy love of God that has pursued them and changed their life. That's what we get to invite people into on the way to joy. Now, as, as he continues, he says, it's not this that we proclaim it. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, let's read this again. I want you to say those highlighted words with me. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Hang that up there for a second. What was the reason that he shared the good news of the holy love of God with them? It's not here so that they would be saved. I think that's a piece of it, but that's not the whole thing. He did not share the gospel with them so that they would pray a prayer of salvation and be done. 
He shares the gospel with them so that they would have fellowship. We'll talk about that word in a minute. With him, the person he shared him with, this isn't something I'm dumping on you. I am inviting you into my life so that you can have fellowship with me and with the Father and the Son and all of us together. Now that word fellowship is koinonia in the Greek. The, the Brits say koinonia, but they also say aluminium and vitamins. So what do they know? <laughs> ko, ko, koinonia is, is, is this. It's relationship plus partnership. We're going to talk about this more next week. It's relationship plus partnership to give you the shorthand version. It's not just I like you and let's hang out. It's not just you're my friend and we hug sometimes. It's not just the, the relationship of, of we get along and we have affection for each other. It's also partnership. It's I'm in this with you. It's you're having a hard day. I'm having a hard day with you. You can't pay your bills this month. I will pay them for you. You're celebrating because something happened in your life. I'm showing up early to the party. I'm helping you set up. I'm eating three bratwursts, and I'm staying after to help you clean. That's, and we're going to do that together and with the Father and the Son, and that's the thing I'm inviting you into. And just because I'm being grumpy about words today, the, the word that we translate that into, I'm not a fan of. We, we translate koinonia. We, we translate that fellowship. And the reason why I don't like the word fellowship is because no one uses that outside of church. You have never been in a fishing boat with someone and they said, I just love the fellowship we're having today. <laughs> that has never happened. How many of you, and I, I'm not beating up on it, but how many of you grew up in a church with a fellowship hall? I did, I did. That's where the donuts were. <laughs> I was, right, you know, and I'm eating donut holes waiting on mom to finish talking with her friends. And here's, here's my beef. I'm not against fellowship halls. I just think that here's the thing. Is eating donuts and talking with your friends fellowship? Not according to this. That's not bad. I'm for donuts. It's, it's the... <laughs> right? I mean, who's, who's like, I'm against donuts. Um, but that's not what this is. This is relationship and partnership and life together. And I'm in this with you. And I don't have a better word, so we're sticking with the word I don't like. We're going to call it fellowship. And he says, I proclaim to you what God has done so that you can have that relationship with me and with the Father and the Son, and part of that is salvation. Part of that is crossing the line of faith. But that's the start. That's not the finish. Then we get to enter a life together that changes things. And, and he goes on. He says, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. To make our joy complete. This this is what this is about. This is about pulling people into the thing. This is about God expanding his family. This isn't just about the father and the son. This is about the father and the son pulling you in and then pulling the next person in and pulling somebody else in until we have the whole world wrapped in his holy love. That's what we're going for. And somehow that makes joy complete. Like, you can experience joy apart from Jesus. That, that thing, that pleasure mixed with meaning. That's joy, right? Pleasure mixed with meaning. I highly recommend it. But it always has an expiration date, right? Not when it's complete in the fellowship of the Father and the Son because that joy was spinning before creation and is going to be spinning after time is done into eternity. And so when he says, I make your joy complete, it's we get that joy now and it doesn't quit. That, that, that thing, that progression of God's done something and it changes me and I proclaim that to you and it pulls us into this relationship together. I, I got to experience just a, a little picture of this last weekend. I, I got to go um, to North Carolina. You can feel sorry for me in Asheville in the Smoky Mountains. Um, for, yeah, 70 degrees. It was beautiful. Um, it's for my grandfather's 90th birthday. And uh, that's just uh, my family. There were uh, his friends and family showed up, and you know, I had this big room, and we're celebrating my 
grandfather, and um, it was great for a couple reasons. One, there was very little family drama this time. Yes. <laughs> Two, we got to celebrate nine decades of someone is, is, you know, human and imperfect as he can be sometimes. Nine decades of faithfully showing us what it means to love God and to love each other and to lay our lives down for each other. My grandfather has done that well. And before the meal, I got to place my hands on my grandfather and say a blessing over him. And you see, there's this thing. It's not just that he did something it's not just that he did something that changed my life. It's that I got to share that with these people and we all get to come together and somehow that makes our joy complete in that moment. Are you tracking? And we get to have that kind of joy with the Father and the Son and with each other. And, and so I just, maybe, maybe just kind of to check this down a little bit in this process so God has done something, but if we stop there, it's just intellectual. It's just something we know happened. But that, that's, not, that's not making joy complete. It's not just that God's done something, it's that we've encountered it. But if we stop there, it's just emotional. It's just, I just feel better. It's just, this is kind of like religion as therapy. It's this, this makes me feel better and that's good and that's fine. But if it stops there, it's just emotional. If we move forward though, if we proclaim it, we share it. But, but if we stop there, it's just dogmatic. It's just someone standing on a street corner telling other people what they should do or what they should know or what God has done for them and how they should change their lives. It's more than that. It's that it pulls them into a relationship with us and with God and you can have fellowship with us and God and that makes our joy complete. I loved reading my commentaries because they were, they were freaking out over the hour joy. They're like, who's the hour? Is that us and God? Is that you and them? Is that, it's everybody. God, us, them, the whole bit. Everyone's joy is complete when that happens. There was um, a fantastic movie that came out about 10 years ago called Into the Wild. Anybody see that? It's just great. And it's about this young um, guy, kind of, you know, romantic uh, idea of um, leaving his family in Georgia and going off and living in the wilderness of Alaska. And it's his journey there. And it's, it's just absolutely great movie. I and mean, I'm going to spoil it for you real quick. At the end of the movie, he eats some berries and gets poisoned and dies alone. Happy New Year. And, um, <laughs> and, and as, he's, as he's dying, um, this, this is what he writes in his journal. This is a true story, by the way. Happiness is only real when shared. If I, if I could maybe just reword that, I would, joy is only complete when shared. Joy is only complete when shared because God is about pulling the whole world into his holy love. So my question for you is, where do you stop in that process? Do you stop at knowing what God has done? Do you stop at experiencing? Do you stop at proclaiming? Or is your joy complete because you have pulled other people into the holy love of God with you and the Father and the Son forever. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have pulled us into the dance. God, would you lead us in such a way that our joy would be perfect, complete, lacking nothing because we offer it to others as we also offer deep relationship with them in you. Amen.